Hello, all YouTubers. I am the Weather Dude. Welcome back to my YouTube channel. Thank you all for tuning back into this weather presentation for June 14th, 2020. Before I get on with today's video, however, I would ask that you please do subscribe because sadly, tons of my watch time has been coming from unsubscribed viewers. We are on our way to our next goal of 600 subscribers. And thank you guys so much, by the way, for 500 subscribers. Let's get to our next goal of 600 subscribers. All right, so please do uh, subscribe and also supplies to every single one of you. Please watch the whole video as well as liking and sharing the video. Thank you. Now let's get on with today's video. All right, so for today's video, we're going to be are doing our next hurricane season discussion again. The primary focus of this discussion or of this video is to do a hurricane season discussion, take a look at the tropics. Um, there will be a mini forecast for the remainder of the season at the end of this video, but if you want the full the forecast for the whole season, I would please do check out after this video my eighth hurricane season forecast and discussion at the top right corner of your screen. But this is my tenth hurricane season discussion um, and the signs of a hyperactive or at least active. 2020 Atlantic hurricane season. So let's get into it. So we do have some, uh, as you saw in the title, I right, didn't lie about that. There's definitely some major updates coming in from the Borough Meteorology, from all the, from the Climate Prediction Center. So let's get right into it. So this is July now. Obviously, you can tell it's updated because there's no June map anymore. There's only a July map now. So this is, we're going to take a look from July through November. And if you look here at July, take a look at this. All the models, and even NASA is getting pretty close to La Nina by, uh, by July here, pretty close. But like I, like I said, in case you guys don't know, negative 0.8 is by Borough Meteorology standards. By our standards, it's you know negative 0.5 for a long period of time. But most models do you do indicate a La Nina. If you look at the the sum of all the models, it's it's literally 0.5 below. So that's pretty much right on the line of La Nina. And if it stays there for a decent amount of time for a couple months, few months, that they will declare that a La Nina officially. But even if it's there for not that long of a period of time. You can still see the La Nina factors. All right, we're still going to be seeing an active hurricane season, even if it if we do have a neutral. Take a look at August. The sum of all the models drops to negative 0.6. Um, and you can see right here. I mean, even the, the media model, the JMA model is a little bit closer to the line, but NASA, NOAA, all in La Nina by this point. Uh, Bird Meteorology model, that's, I, I kind of realized a couple videos ago what, what BOM meant. It was actually the Bird Meteorology. So they actually have their own model that is there at the top. But... Again, there and there it is. So we took a look at September. Take a look at how many we got the Borough Meteorology, the NASA, NOAA, all in La Nina now. All right, and and this and you like you might be thinking, why is La Nina so important? Well, the far to the left these models are, the um, the La Nina does mean a more active hurricane season. All right, and why? Because as you're going to see, and this is because this is a discussion video. You're going to see why here. We're talking about less wind shear. We're talking about less dry air. Um, we're talking about more rising air because if you have a sinking motion like we do in El Nino, more higher pressure and we just don't see too much activity uh, really heating up in the tropics. But if we have more of a rising motion in the atmosphere like we're going to with this season, that would mean some more hurricanes potentially and some more tropical development. All right, so that's September. If we go to October now, again, not much movement through September to October. And then, and then November, again, looks just about the same. But... A lot of models do take a close to La Nina, if not a negative neutral, at least. So here, this is also updated here. Here's a Nino 3-4, like from the spaghetti models. And notice how we do drop by end of August, beginning of September, we drop right into a La Nina and stay there and maybe go back up as hurricane season ends. Maybe. At least, at least that's what the sum of all these models is saying. If you go back to a weak El Nino or neutral by winter time, maybe, maybe another active winter, who knows? But that's way down the line. But this is from this is model run from uh, just from a few days ago. You can see a lot of spaghetti models are concentrated on La Nina or at least negative neutral below that zero line. Not one model goes into El Nino. There's always that one crazy model, but it doesn't seem to be that way. If you look at the Nino three four probabilities, again, no chance of El Nino whatsoever. All right. Um, there isn't as good of a chance uh, for for here for um excuse me. For La Nina, but as we head throughout the season here, all right, so take a look at this 83.8% chance of neutral, all right, as we head through July, and then as we head throughout the uh, throughout the summer, 
again, La Nina's chances will start to go up, and eventually, October, we have a great, we have a better chance of La Nina than we do neutral. So that's something interesting that we've got to keep our eyes on. Um, if you look at the Nino 34 SST anomalies, again, uh, July, let me switch my color real quick. So at July here, we're 0.5 degrees below average for Nino 34 region. September, we're negative 0.6 and negative 0.7 by November. So notice how we, as we drop, as we head throughout hurricane season, so maybe the end of hurricane season, when we are usually active, which is like September, that's when we could see the most activity. And not to mention, we're having growing, we're having, you know, the factors are really starting to come together even as we head throughout hurricane season. So those two factors are going to lead to a big hurricane season. Hopefully that made sense because if you think about it, September is already an active month for hurricanes usually. If we have growing, if we have more of a, a conducive atmosphere as we head through September, that's just a bad combination. So here are the latest ocean temperature anomalies. And again, the Caribbean is one place that's been doing well lately. One to two degrees above average Celsius, which is two degrees above average, two to four degrees above average Fahrenheit. Southeast coast, we do see some warm waters as well. Obviously with Cristobal and some tropical systems moving through the Gulf of Mexico, we retreated the more average. I mean, the western part and the eastern part of the Gulf is still above average, but for the most part, Gulf of Mexico has been chilling down a little bit. Here it is by Bermuda. We see some a lot of colder waters by Bermuda. But other than that, the Caribbean is doing pretty well. All right, take a look. We do have one little spot in the Caribbean that's 30 degrees Celsius now, which is well into the upper 80s, but still, mid to upper 80s throughout much of the Caribbean here. Not a 30 degree spot right there, just by Cuba, south of Cuba there. But again, Caribbean is very warm. It's almost like a heat bubble. It's like a hot tub. And, and trust me, there is going to be some more. There's going to be some more heating up still. All right, so you guys just wait. And even up by the uh, Chesapeake, the Delmarva, we've gotten near 70 now. Upper, even low 70s, upper 60s. So water by the Mid Atlantic is trying to heat up. But if you remember, if you if you've been watching my series on the Atlantic Hurricane videos, if you're watching since the beginning, or and if you watch the about the maybe sixth or seventh one. Um, you did notice that we start to have some cooling of the waters here off the coast of Africa. We're starting to see some more orange splotches starting to take over here. All right, the blue area is kind of thinning out. We have one little stripe of blue left. But other than that, the East Tropical Atlantic is starting to warm up a little bit. We're starting to see those 80 degree waters get a lot closer now than before. Like before, they were all the way back here. Now they've advanced eastward and northward. So eventually, this whole entire map may be filled with dark greens and yellows and oranges eventually as we head through September. That's when the waters get their warmest. But still, if a tropical wave were to come off of Africa, it's still some cold water, and it, the water will get warmer as it heads farther westbound. So we still have some warming waters. Again, you're not going to see activity um, by the coast of Africa here, at least for another month. So definitely not to worry about yet. We're not going to have to worry about that region yet, but it's still, it's still nice to see that we're starting to see the factors come together. Here is the Caribbean here, ocean temperature anomaly for the Caribbean as a whole. Again, 0. 0.6 degrees above average. And notice how it's June 14th. Look at this. June 6, 14. That was kind of weird. I kind of noticed that. So, I don't know. But still, 0. 0.6 degrees above average, which is very, very warm for, for the Caribbean because the Caribbean is already a very warm spot in the tropics. So, the fact that it's over a half degree above average Celsius, the fact that it's a degree or a degree and a half degree warmer, than average Fahrenheit really says something. The MDR, in case you don't know what the main development region is, is that little region off the coast of Africa um, that extends westbound. And this is where you're going to start to see hurricanes really develop as we head through the summer, right in that region there. So that is the MDR. And the MDR is 0.4 degrees above average. So again, the, and it used to be closer to average. So the MDR is starting to do a little bit better, which is good for developing tropical cyclones. North Atlantic, again, this does include the Arctic, but still, we're starting to see North Atlantic retreat closer to average. We're starting to get to near that zero line, but that's more of the subtropics. If you look at the East Tropical Atlantic, again, we start to go warm. This place goes up and down a lot. I mean, if you look, I mean, April before we were, you know, we were, I mean, 0.4 degrees above average. And all of a sudden, beginning of May, we were 0.3 below. So this does drop a lot and go up a lot. But still, uh, we, we're definitely above average for this time of year, for the East Tropical Atlantic already. So... These are some of the signs that were that the hurricane season could be pretty active. And if you look at the Nino 3-4 region here, take a look at this. We're starting to see a little bounce back. But obviously, for the Nino 3-4 region, we want to see a decline because that means closer to La Nina. And we and you saw right here. If we look at mid-April, we were at you know 0.7. We were near El Nino actually. 
and at our lowest point by the end of May, in just based, like a month actually, we went from 0.7 degrees above average to 0.6 degrees below average. So a huge drop in the new 3.4 index, just like that. That's all I needed. We were waiting for the drop. It wasn't really coming, and it's here finally, and the perfect time too. In terms of the charcoal intensity index, Bay of Campeche right there in the southwestern Gulf of Mexico, according to this, is looking favorable for development. Caribbean, it's not highly unfavorable for development, but it's just unfavorable, which is that next shade, which is a little bit better. Well, we have a couple little patches here of yellow. If it was orange or red, that means it's more favorable for development. Yellow or green means it's not favorable. If you look at the 26 and a half degree isotherm, again, this is saying, because we know that we have warm water at the surface in the Caribbean, but how far underwater can we get? How far under, you know, how far under, underwater can we get and still see those 80 degree, 80 degree water temperatures? So in parts, and just down to Cuba there, you can see that we have a little area of orange and red, about 150, 175 meters below sea level, which means that of over, if we go 500 feet below the surface of the ocean here, the surface of the water, we can still see 80 degree water temperatures. And the fact that it's 80 degrees below the surface still is what really gets those hurricanes going here. But take a look at this. If you watched my previous hurricane discussion number nine, there was just a huge difference. And this is just a six day difference. The entire Caribbean is not only filled with reds and oranges, but whites, all right, which is to the top of the tropical cyclone heat potential scale. And here it is, south of Cuba. We have had excessive tropical cyclone heat potential just south of Cuba there. And even outside of that, all we really need is that red shading, which is like 110, 120 plus, which is right in this region, right here, the entire Caribbean. So the Caribbean is doing really well with the tropical cyclonic heat, and this heat is what's going to fuel hurricanes. So this, is, this can lead to a destructive hurricane season. If you look at the Gulf of Mexico, again, that 26 and a half degree isotherm, like I showed you first, for the Caribbean, not quite as high. I mean, we still do have 225. I mean, go a couple hundred feet below the surface, we can still see some, you know, 80 degree waters, which isn't bad. Uh, but eventually, that warm water, warm energy from the Caribbean is going to start spilling out into the Gulf of Mexico, and it already has in some spots. But if we look at the tropical cyclonic heat potential, it's gotten a lot better. All right, it's definitely gotten a lot better. We're more uh, 50, 60, 70 on the scale. Even a little patch here where the Gulf Stream starts that maybe closer to 100 on the TCHP scale, which is definitely higher. But that, that moisture, that not the moisture, the tropical cyclonic heat is bottled up in the Caribbean. It's eventually going to spill out into the Gulf of Mexico as we head throughout hurricane season. One thing that La Nina contributes to, we know that we're going to be in a neutral or La Nina phase potentially. One thing that a neutral La Nina can do is lower the dry air. And you can see Gulf of Mexico for much of the Gulf, much of the Caribbean, even the Western Atlantic here, all right, not as much. Uh, but even throughout the, much of the tropics, there is some dry air, but it's not too excessive as it usually is May into June. But even, I mean, as low amounts of dry air that we do have, dry air will be shrinking, actually, as we have throughout hurricane season. That's obviously going to lead to more development. We're starting to see some thunderstorms. Obviously, we know that the early time of year, the thunderstorms get suppressed south of that 10-degree north latitude line because of the dry air. But eventually, you're going to start to see more storms like this come out farther north because there's no dry air there to block them anymore. It's like, I'm done with you. All right, wind shear is a little high right now. Again, it could very well be coincidental. We still got a long way to go in the season. We still do have some growing patches, however, right by Africa there, some lower amounts of wind shear. In the Northern Gulf, we have some lower amounts of wind shear, but again, this does change greatly day to day. So it's very dependent, but that map will be more useful when we actually have like a tropical cyclone coming through. We'll really be able to tell, but the Caribbean, Wind shear for the Caribbean is actually well below its average and in, uh, indicated by the black line. So wind shear for the Caribbean is actually below average. Uh, tropical Atlantic, I'd say we're right on average. Um, again, late July as well as late September are when we have our, our two lowest uh, times when we have the lowest wind shear is late July, late September for the tropical Atlantic. Um, if you look at the wind shear values, um, the, at least the wind shear anomaly, this is from June 16th to June 21st. Again, the GFS model, but watch, watch Africa, right? I want you to watch this region right here and watch as this deep area of, like this area of deep blue comes off and some very low amounts of wind shear. That's not going to stick around for too long, but this, this, this is a sign here that we can start to see more of this happening. So these deep areas of lower wind shear, all right, 
And this is by 25th to the 30th of June now. And we still see some lower wind shear by north of Africa. But again, it's June. It's still early. This is through the end of June. Um, and that lower wind shear can hit. It's a sign of what we could see um, later on in the hurricane season. Um, this is the forecast for the remainder of the hurricane season. Again, you want the full forecast, check out my eighth hurricane discussion. You can even go to my channel page if you want. And if you go to under playlist, you'll be able to see the my 2020 hurricane Alex. There's 10 videos there. Uh, you can go under there and go to the eighth one if you want the full forecast after this video. But this is for the remainder of the season, including the three that we've already, uh, obviously the three that we already had. So it, the full forecast, you just add three to those. But for the remainder of the season, not including the three storms we already had, Amanda, I'm sorry, not Amanda, um, Arthur, Bertha, and Cristobal, um, not including those, we have 12 to 18 named storms left, 8 to 12 hurricanes, and 3 to 7 major hurricanes. Usually in a season, an entire season, we've had 12 named storms, 6 hurricanes, and 3 major hurricanes, usually in a typical season. All right, so again, high pressure systems, this is what I've been showing you guys, and the tropical system could get steered towards the United States. This is why the East Coast Watch out, might see more hurricane landfalls this season. That video is also in the top right corner of your screen if you want to watch after this video. Um, hopefully I'll be doing another update on that, on that, why the East Coast could see more hurricane landfalls or tropical storm landfalls. But again, this is as we head throughout the season, and here you go. I mean, the models just in the ensemble models just indicate right there that we can have an, a stronger area of high pressure building right to the north here, and that can steer tropical systems right towards the United States. This is what's going to be happening throughout hurricane season. So Thank you guys for watching today's video. I am Dweather Dude signing off. Till next time. Catch you guys next video.